You're listening to Experience Imagination, a themed entertainment design podcast presented by Falcons Creative Group. Every episode, we discuss a new topic with a panel of creative professionals. Hi, I'm Cecil McPurry, President and Chief Creative Officer of Falcons. Hi, everyone. Welcome back to Experience Imagination. This is Abhinav Narayan, your moderator for the episode. Halo Outpost Discovery is a touring fan experience that traveled across the United States, starting right here in Orlando, Florida, and ending in Anaheim, California. Falcons was honored to provide narrative and media for multiple experiences found throughout the venue. In just a few moments, I'll be joined by a few members of our team to discuss the narrative and creative vision of Outpost Discovery. We'll also be joined by some special guests. We'll go around the table and get introductions, and for this episode, I'll actually go ahead and start us off. I'm Abhinav Narayan. I'm creative content specialist at Falcons, and I was lead writer on this project. I'm Cecil McPurry. I'm the chief creative officer here at Falcons Creative Group. Hi, I'm Jason Ambler. I'm the VP and executive producer of digital media here at Falcons. Hi, I'm Andreas Latourette. I'm a technical artist here, but I helped with the narrative and scripts. Cecil, what's different about Outpost Discovery compared to some of the other work that we've done in the past? You know, we work on a lot of projects, and to have a project that has such a huge fan base already. Right. You know, it's an IP that has this amazing ecosystem in a different medium, and all of a sudden has this fan base that's incredible. You would think that a brick-and-mortar environment would have been realized by now, you know? Yeah. Because the fans, they've been asking for something tangible for the longest of times, right? I mean... Yeah. I know it manifests itself in different mediums, like comic books and, you know, et cetera. Novels. And there's been the occasional, and, uh, like, championship event kind right, of thing that they right. have. Oh, okay, yeah. But to realize something with this level of immersion and level of narrative... World building. World too. building at play, I don't think has ever been done. Maybe by fans. You know, yeah, like, yeah, like exactly. fan-based, fan-built stuff, mm-hmm. yeah. probably. How did Falcons become involved in this project? A lot of our experience in content development revolves around dome content. Yeah. And so we were approached to basically bid on developing one of the key attractions within this touring experience where guests will be able to experience the ring. Fly through a ring, take a tour. For the first time ever. Yeah. Yeah. that, That was a big deal. And, you know, we were approached by Hershen Live, which is a relatively new division of Hershen Family Entertainment, which is a long-lasting brand, huge history that, you know... Of operating things. Operating Dollywood. And creating IPs and, as well. Yep. Yeah. And uh, several regional parks throughout the United States and, uh, you know, starting to branch off into new ventures with the Harlem Globetrotters, now with the Halo Traveling Experience. And Hershen, I think, brought our name up to 343 because Cecil had already been out there and had a relationship with them, they said, oh, yeah, Falcons, you know, it was already (laughs) known. It wasn't, who are these guys? It was, yeah, we know those guys. They're great. We met Cecil. They're awesome. Yeah, we would totally want them, you know, on this project. And I felt like a natural fit. Yeah, Yeah. yeah, it, it really helped that we had that relationship that had gone back even several years, kind of assuring that, you know, they they were in good hands. Um, You know, obviously, they are content creators themselves. So they take a lot of pride and Um, They have a lot of understanding of what it takes. Yeah, to that point, Jason, I want to ask, what does it take to transport guests to a Halo ring world? Cecil, we pitched a pretty unique idea to Hershen Live in 343. Can you tell us a little bit about that? As part of our efforts to develop the narrative and emotional arc of the actual dome experience, having introduced a unique way to justify the logic of the guest being transported and being able to be at the ring, that introduction of the logic behind it yeah. ended up allowing us to introduce a new vehicle, vehicle in the Halo Cannon. Ecos- yeah, Cannon. Let's, let, let's talk so about that, that for a bit. That is, excites me. Yeah, that was... You know, let's talk about the, the UNSC Honeybee. Yes. Yeah. Having this dome theater where you actually take a quote-unquote virtual tour of a ring presented this incredible opportunity to actually motivate that with an in-universe vehicle, the UNSC Honeybee, as a remote camera drone 
that is capable of flying through the universe. And it just, it clicked. Yeah. It, it worked really well. Like, All I just that. remember I think being it was very solving, nervous yeah, it about was, pitching it. Yeah. Just because right. it was going to be so disappointing if it wasn't embraced. Right. You know, it, yeah. it made so much sense. The logic was so sound. I was so nervous about getting it passed. And immediately it just reinforced, you know, of course it would pass because they understood the logic behind it. That yeah. relationship with 343 and that process that we went through and their trust in us yeah. to kind of take their trusted IP and reintroduce it in a different way. I mean, they totally embraced it, and that was exciting. It was awesome. That yeah. was awesome. That really stood out to me, actually. Uh, a lot of fans were coming up to me, and it, they, they almost had a, a sense of ownership because it, they realized after a while that the honeybee was created for them, right? Yeah. I had people tell me, That's a great point. Yeah, That's, yeah, that is For a good this point. weekend, I am in the Halo universe. Like, I, I could exist out there somewhere. Somewhere, right? In those games that I've played. I am almost like myself and the character that I now embody yeah. in Halo. So they realize in that moment, the honeybee was created for us, the people who are being recruited, the people here at Outpost Discovery, and they almost felt this kinship. Yes, uh, and, a connection. And they, they were like, when am I going to see this vehicle again? Yeah. They were just ready for oh. more of it, and that really blew me away. That's awesome. That is exciting. You need to know what the role of the guests are. Right. Yeah. And it has to be clear and concise, you That's know. Right. And so and that helped us motivate why we modified the actual design of the theater itself. Mm-hmm. That motivated the scale and size of the actual you yeah. know, honeybee. I mean, all this logic, having that buy off allowed us to mature everything else. That's right. It's and, it's the authenticity. Yeah. The, the, you know, the, the, and we've had a podcast about that. Exactly. <laughs> the the, the <laughs> keyword that we keep coming back to, you know, I think it just brought a layer of rich authenticity to what we were creating mm-hmm. right. that just felt so in line with the Halo universe. That's both 343 understanding it from an IP standpoint, where we really helped sculpt it from a knowledgeable Halo fan base internally. I mean, we had our own, what do we call them? Halo Guardians. Guardians. We had our own (laughs) internal Guardians, which they totally appreciated. But more importantly, it's not Guardian for Guardian's sake. It's not just understanding IP. It's applying it to guest absorbing the information in a unique LBE or location-based type of experience, which... Hirsch and Live also respected the fact that we know our stuff when it comes to attraction design. Right. So now we had guardianship of the Halo IP. We had knowledge of attractions and how guests absorb information in story. Mm-hmm. And we were able to add value not only just by being a content provider, but really being part of the round table to help elevate this new product of theirs. You know, So to me, that was exciting. There's definitely a profound art in taking a story that's been told over several games, se- uh, you know, hundreds of hours of gameplay, and now reducing that into a short haiku of a story that has to last only a few minutes, you yeah, know, absolutely. totally satisfying from a guest experience, a fan, and from a... From a new uh, perspective. Yeah, a new perspective, someone who doesn't understand the, the deep storyline and still enjoy the spectacle of And the I think you saw a lot of that even at the Outpost um, was you saw a really good mix of people that were fans, but then they brought their friends right. and their family members, and they were experiencing a lot of the, the storytelling for the first time, and they were just as yeah. happy with yeah. the Yeah, absolutely. I like the tier conversation of true fans, the curious fan, and the casual fan. You know, those were all present in this experience, which was nice to see all of them embracing as one of their top experiences was the ring, yeah. right? Andreas and I actually had the opportunity to sit down and talk to one of the fans from the community. Ian Browning Smith is also known as Halo Cannon on YouTube. He hosted his own panel at the Chicago event, and it was a pleasure to speak with him. We'll jump into that interview now. Hey, Ian, how's it going? It's going pretty well. Cool. Thanks for joining. Thank you for inviting me on. It's an honor. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> My first question is, what initial thoughts and emotions did you have when you first heard about Outpost after it was announced? So that's actually kind of interesting because I was part of a group that during uh, 343's regular community day in PAX West specifically, they brought a few of us in to kind of get a preview of certain things, one of those being Outpost Discovery. Awesome. The room was pretty excited, but for me personally, I I was definitely very excited, very blown away. It's I had never thought to bring Halo in that direction, to have like a dedicated Halo event like that. Like, yeah. A lot of Halo fans will remember uh, Halo Fest back in 2011. That was regularly used during promotion for comparison. 
And, you know, a lot of Halo fans missed out and were very bummed out that nothing like that ever happened again. So Outpost Discovery became that second chance. I, yeah, I can imagine, you know, especially for someone who's known as such a, a lore buff and, and someone who's <laughs> more more deeply integrated into the Halo canon uh, and the Halo universe than, you know, many of the other passionate fans are the, the idea of stepping into a physical space that is canonically part of the Halo universe. I mean, just the it's it's a fascinating idea. Very much so. Like, in fact, I held a panel at the Chicago event recently. And one of my favorite things to shout out to the audience was, you are all canon to the Halo universe, (laughs) which is technically true at that point. When we're at the outpost, we're all civilians from the UEG visiting and learning about all this stuff. It's a really immersive way of getting into Halo. What was it like for you to be in a physical space that was canon? There there are a lot of different, there were some theming elements, there were some graphics and, and elements like that. Anything that stood out to you? Oh, yeah. I think you said it really is like, it's the little details that you find throughout. Like, yeah. actually, a long time ago on my channel, I did a video series called Multiplayer Map Lore. And the entire idea was to get various Halo lore fans together and just walk around one of the Halo multiplayer maps and talk about things on the map, the backstory, all that jazz. It, like, doing that for real, that's what going to Outpost was like. It's going yeah. to this place in the Halo universe, not necessarily being an archaeologist in the same way you would be on a Halo map, but a very, I think the closest you could get to that kind of experience and seeing like some of the various artifacts around, like, I think one of my favorites was the pistol, the M6C pistol that belonged to the captain of a marathon class vessel that fought over Biko in 2526. For one thing, I loved seeing all the ties, especially going home, like after the fact and like searching through Halopedia and it's like, Oh, wow. Here's where all these references are from and Looking how it ties into yeah. the grander the lore. Bits, yeah. I actually had many people come up to me. I was at the Chicago event as well. And at least from my standpoint, you know, I, I like to talk to them as just a fan, like fan to fan, see how they, they felt about things. And I heard quite a few stories and tales of people saying a lot of that stuff I already knew, but there were definitely some things I didn't know. And that's cool, you know, hearing that from a, a hardcore fan. But there were yeah. a lot of families at the event. And a lot of those families were saying, I finally know what Halo truly is yeah. and why my family is so in love with this franchise. And that was a really moving moment for me. Ian, do you see this as an opportunity for the Halo fandom to expand? Oh, absolutely. There were a few people that specifically um, in the line wait for the author signing on the second day, a lot of these people hadn't read this or they had a very casual understanding of the Halo lore up to that point. And they were just excited after experiencing the Outpost to see like what else Halo has to offer. So one thing I absolutely love about Outpost is as entrenched it is in the lore, it has offerings for every aspect of, of Halo you suddenly feel engaged in a way that makes you want to dive deeper. And that that is something that is, I think, very unique about the whole experience, for sure. So, uh, Ian, full disclosure, Andreas and I are fans of your channel. We, we've we <laughs> been watching a few videos. We were watching uh, some you. of your Discovery Dispatch videos while we were still working on the project, and we were really excited to see your kind of uh, debrief after you went to the initial Orlando trip. Could you share your thoughts going through the ring experience? Because you pointed to that in your video as one of the highlights of the venue. And I wanted to hear from you why you thought that was the case. Really, I think a lot of it was just getting a sense of scale to the Halo universe that's often hard to grasp. Going through that ring experience, at the start you get the section of the ring, but then you get to the Sentinel. The Sentinel is still what blew me away. Objectively, I knew the size of these things. Yes, it is massive. Actually seeing that when you're not a seven foot two yeah, Spartan. super soldier, <laughs> yeah, Spartan, is just mind blowing. You hear that, it's like, oh, we capture this and deactivate. How did you capture that? <laughs> How did you capture something that big? <laughs> but then from there, of course, that you know, you get to the other displays, which again give you that that sense of scale, especially the flood. Every time I go through the, the ring experience, I love to just talk to anybody I can when you see the you see the flood form. It's like just imagine that. Yeah burrowing its way into your chest and wrapping its tentacles around your spinal cord. It's terrifying. Like you get you get to see that up close and personal in Halo 3, but there's a whole nother level when you see that infection form right in front of you. And then, of course, you get to the ring experience itself, which it's really cool to see all that stuff animated, alive, especially the Space Whales, man. 
Yeah. I love the space whale. I just love the space I the Scalaviathans. When I was so when cool. I was finished with my panel, I, I saw Ian's face and he, after the space whales portion, he was just beaming and it made me feel great. It was it was really nice and <laughs> it was fun for us in the office yeah, too. Just absolutely seeing that come to life. They're starting to bring in the biology and the wildlife that they dreamed about at that time. You know, it's yeah. been almost you know, a couple decades almost now. And we're finally seeing this this flora and fauna that's always been just yeah. something people have really anticipated. And it was really yeah. beautiful. Like It had been regulated literally to concept art up to that point. Exactly. Yeah. We have all this amazing concept art of the, of the sky leviathans and the blind wolves mm-hmm. and a dozen other creatures from across the various Halo games. And you know, prior to your experience, yeah, the only time we really got to see that with any kind of detail was in Halo Hunters in the Dark, because a book. Exactly. Right. Which was really cool, but there's a whole different level to actually literally seeing that. Cool. Again, really appreciate you taking the time to talk to us. It's always a pleasure to hear from the fans, from from the guests who actually went and experienced what we talk about. So thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. It was a lot of fun talking Halo. Of course, man. Thank you. Thanks again so much to Ian for sitting down with us. It was a pleasure to speak with him. And if you want to know more about the lore of the Halo universe, or even the lore of Outpost Discovery, you can check out his YouTube channel, Halo Canon. Real quick, before we move on any further, Jason, could you run us through everything Falcons was responsible for providing to Outpost Discovery? Yeah, sure. So, you know, when we were approached, uh, we weren't approached just to do the Ring Dome experience. That was part of a multi-pronged kind of themed entertainment media production yeah. scope, which included quite a bit of audio yeah. uh, design. We did two interactive attractions, the the Covenant Escape and Pelican training experience. We did the audio for the those. The audio for those and mixing. And then we you know we did all the training videos, which are significant. Um, oh yeah. Those are always much more involved than you would expect. Yeah. We really wanted to represent the diversity of the fan base, you know, genders, Within ethnicities, cultures. Yeah. And so each of the casting choices we made, we wanted to try and represent a different diverse kind of segment of the Halo community. Yeah. yeah. And so that was a big part of our filters when we were looking at casting and character types. And even then when we had cast these characters, we challenged the norms of what you would expect these types of characters to act or be. Turn it on their hands. Yeah, yeah exactly, which, which is also really refreshing. So, you know, obviously you're seeing, maybe you may see a familiar face, but maybe it's not how they've been traditionally played. The other thing I liked a lot is the integration of humor. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, because you have to entertain someone in the queue line. It's not just right. about giving them information. It's how they retain information. And humor helps mm-hmm. with that, right? So You that's, remember it a lot more easily if you were laughing. Like exactly. Yeah. So that, I mean, I, I watch it and I just, I, I crack up in some of the scenes and how mm-hmm. the humor aspects were integrated. Andreas, you were saying when you were down for the Chicago event that you, there were a lot of people who were coming up to you remembering those jokes. Oh, and, absolutely. Yeah, That that's something that I, I remember you and I worked very hard on because we felt that humor is actually a huge part of the Halo universe. It's mm. a serious yeah. story. It's grand and epic in scale. But when you're down there on the boots on the ground with the soldiers, they're actually making jokes and cracking wise because it's, All the time, it's yeah. just fun for you as the player. Right. It keeps you invested in them. You want to keep them safe it, and it stuff like that. It humanizes them. You yeah. Know? Absolutely. Yeah, it really exactly. does. So we, I, I, I was actually very surprised. I had a lot of people come up to me and say, oh, you, you guys wrote the scripts for all those videos? I was laughing at all these different lines and it, it really that made me... That is refreshing to hear. Yeah, it, it, I, I think it that. really That's helped great. them become invested in the experience that they were about to, wow. you know, uh, be a part of. We had a lot of fun inserting Easter eggs yes. for, you know, the Halo fans who are really, really deep, deep into, into it. it yeah. And of course, you know, to Andreas's point, a lot of these human soldier characters throughout the games do have that humor. And one of the most iconic examples is the character of Sergeant Johnson from uh, Halo 1, 2, and 3. And translating that sass, that sarcasm, that wit, that humor into these four new characters who become your drill instructors for the attractions was a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Having a traveling experience, you know, Hershen and Entertainment and Hershen Live, to come up with this approach to take this IP and introduce it in this way. I think immediately brick and mortar permanent, you know, draw them as a business model. But 
it's obviously very successful. I think it speaks to there's a trend in the, in the industry now to create event driven entertainment things that draw you out of your house for a, a limited time, mm-hmm. right? Because you know the the, uh, the motto of if you build it, they will come. Now you have to kind of keep reinventing and even make it more limited or more exclusive because that's going to help people get yeah. out of their houses and come out and do your event. And you're even seeing this in in the brick and mortars now. They'll create seasonal events and things like that that right. you have to. Right. You know, it's that have to. It's that it's tapping into that FOMO. You have to missing. now. You yeah. don't want right? to miss it. What I like about exactly. it, it is here for certain dates. So you exactly. have to make a commitment and yeah. go. Themed entertainment is more and more getting regionalized, coming to the people, whether it's these traveling experiences, the live touring experiences, retail-tainment opportunities. Yeah. And, and all, all these different mediums are starting to blend. Yes. You know? Yeah. Because the delivery mm-hmm. of this experience didn't feel like a trade show. It was greater than that. Mm-hmm. I mean, there were key attractions within the experience, you know? So at the time of recording, we've all now had an opportunity to at least visit Outpost Discovery at its first touring location where it debuted right here in Orlando, which was very fortunate mm-hmm. for us. Um, but leading up to the debut of Outpost Discovery, I'm curious to know what detail or experience were you all most interested to see brought to life? I was more excited just to experience the whole event and kind of as a feel whole, the energy and feel, feel the, the energy. Yeah, see yeah. the see the fans and see what they were going to be bringing because they were bringing their costumes and cosplay and yeah. I mean they were going all out too. They were bringing their A game as much as the touring exhibition what, brought their game. One of my favorite things about Outpost Discovery is that there's a whole ecosystem of fan-generated panel discussions that the event caters to. You are allowed to schedule your own panel and host it at the event. And I've heard, uh, you know, what some of the other panels have been throughout some of the other touring locations that are going on. And it's really fascinating and really, I guess, heartwarming to see a major franchise opening like an official door, Opening creating the, an official the platform. limelight and stage for exactly. those who are embracing the brand. Exactly. I, just, I thought that that was really cool. Just to your point, Jason, about you know that community aspect of it. Yeah, it was really powerful. Another fan who participated in a panel at Outpost Discovery was Oren from Halo Podcast Evolved. Andreas and I had the pleasure to speak with him as well, and I'll let him introduce himself to start things off. My name is uh, Oren Domang, and uh, I'm a co-host and co-producer on the... Halo Podcast Evolved podcast. That's a kind of a weekly lore-focused uh, community podcast. Well, uh, we just wanted to bring you in today to just talk about Outpost Discovery as a whole and kind of your thoughts. I know you guys had some panels, but just to kick it off, we were wondering definitely what were your initial thoughts and kind of emotions? What did you go through when you first heard about Outpost Discovery, you know, during its initial announcement? Uh, well, its uh, initial announcement was just kind of just pure excitement, um, just kind of something new to uh, experience Halo. Um, I've been to a few championship series events, um, whether it's like DreamHack or some of the uh, local kind of Microsoft Store ones. And so those are always fun to kind of go to these trade show like events and uh, hang out with other Halo fans and right, watch yeah. <laughs> c- competitive Halo and all Absolutely. that. And so to hear a more community and fan focused event just was kind of another way to experience Halo. And so all of us on the show were, were just pretty, pretty excited uh, from the get go. Um, and then just kind of figuring out which location I would eventually go to. What was the experience like to actually finally be there and see Halo brought to life in a tangible, physical way? It didn't really hit me until I literally walked through the door. Um, (laughs) Kind of right when you walk through the door, you see Outpost Discovery up top of just like, wow, this is like really cool that this type of event was made for fans like me. And just it really brought it to life. And to open the Discovery event with the Hall of History of just seeing these life-size statues and the warthog and all these other kind of tidbit information that you would see at a museum, if you will. So each sort of moment invokes a different personal story for me at times. To that point of the vast universe, as a lore-focused podcast and as a, you know, probably a lore buff and a fan yourself, we were wondering what piece of new lore that you discovered during your time at Outpost excited you the most on a, maybe just a personal level, but also maybe as a, from a big picture level as well. 
Um, well, I'd say um, on a personal level, I think it's kind of just the canonization of the event. Like this event happens in universe after the war, yeah. the Cuban Covenant War in 2553. And so to have that not only be like a representation of like, oh, this is what this event would be like um, in the Halo universe, but it's like, oh, well, you going to this event is as if you are a civilian of that time learning about the history of the rings and the history of the human covenant war because you know prior to that and during wartime a lot of this stuff is considered you know classified information exactly. and different people from different colonies don't have the full picture and through each of the attractions they they get you to that and that's that's kind of how on a smaller level like each of those attractions are designed to you know, this is a Covenant Corvette that we scavenged and found and we've repurposed to have you experience it um, as if you were a Marine or, or um, yeah. a Spartan going through. So like just the way they've interacted that on a canon level, but then to be the ones actually doing it, it's, it's, it's a gratifying feeling. On a big picture level, I'd say it would be the inclusion of the UNSC Honeybee drone. But, um, but yeah, I see the honeybee sort of graphic on the side, and I'm like, man, what is that? That looks so weird. Um, and then, like, I'm, like, listening to it, and uh, and Gabriella starts explaining the honeybee, and I'm like, oh, wow. And so I just get so fascinated. Was there any other aspect of the event or any attraction that maybe exceeded your expectations or even took you by surprise that you weren't expecting when you visited? And how so? Different levels took me by surprise in different ways just because I... I mean, I had a, a certain level of expectation, but I didn't try to overhype it, so to speak. Of, sure. You know, because you know, I I try to just let myself completely separate from the real world and just try to just get into it and and be like, okay, I'm here in this completely foreign environment. I, I've never seen this Covenant ship before, and I'm going into it, and then we're we're doing all this, and then some, you know hunter starts coming and so some peril starts happening and so gabriella has to guide us through to get out and kind of working together as a team and for the most part outpost discovery and hirsch and live and and you guys and everyone involved did a really nice job designing these attractions to be relatively simple but then also just very immersive and like even the pelican trainery simulator like that was just awesome like you know, you know it's kind of coming but to be at your own little station and calling out things and working with your fellow fans it's, it's a really good way to immerse the uh, the guest and the and the fan into yeah. the uh, the attraction. Just getting to sit in those seats was a big deal. I know for me personally, I just the lights and the way the sounds affected, it, it's like it's something you've dreamed of, right? So it's just really nice to actually get to feel it and be like this is this is a tough job, you know. It's <laughs> yeah. kind of fun. Uh, we were wondering <laughs> if there were any other elements of the the ring experience as a whole that you know stood out to you or meant something to you. The ending video, I guess, is is kind of what would mean the most, just because it it recaps kind of the whole conflict from discovering these rings to the end of the Human Covenant War, and then it kind of looks at to what the future is, and so kind of watching it it invokes all these emotions from the years that I've had with this uh, with this franchise. Yeah. You know, not only just edited well, but it it you know emotionally was kind of brought up in a very uh, very strong way, and and again another unique way to. Um, experience this with it being kind of this dome capsule that, that are video surveillance from the honeybee. So I guess that that dome experience was probably the highlight um, and kind of very stood out because I wasn't expecting that walking in. I, I kind of thought the ring experience would be this, like I said, the kind of walk through a museum. Yeah. Uh, but to actually experience it and kind of do the fly throughs was very interesting and, and yeah, rewarding. Oren, this was a blast. Really great to talk to you. Thank you so much for doing this. We really appreciate yeah. it. It's a big deal. Thank you. Yeah, man. thank you guys for uh, for having me. And it's Andreas, good to talk to you again. Of course. And um, and I was I was ecstatic to hear about your involvement, and couldn't be any more proud to to kind of know you and see you be creative. And uh, yeah, thanks thanks for having me, and wish you guys luck on your your future projects. Thank Absolutely. You, man. Special thanks to Oren for joining us on today's episode. We really appreciated talking to him. And if you're a Halo fan, please check out Halo Podcast Evolved wherever you get your podcast from. Jason, I wanted to ask you about some of the other new things Falcons was able to introduce to the Halo universe for Outpost Discovery. The new things that we were able to introduce to Halo canon were the UNSC Honeybee. Yep. 
Also, the Sky Leviathan, which is a flying yeah, yeah. Um, creature, space yes. whale. Space whale, yeah. A guy literally cheered when I started talking about the Sky Leviathan. In, in your it, presentation? Yeah, yeah. He, he was very excited because I, I, 343 has always wanted to make Halo this diverse bio this ecosystem. An and ecology. And they've always the had to ring pull, world. Exactly. And they've always had to pull it back because of limitations of hardware and software. But now we're seeing, you know, with, with our technology, Technology and our, our film, we didn't have those limitations anymore. So all the ideas that they always wanted to put in but could never find the space for made it into our film. And the yeah. fans were just so ecstatic over that. And that whale was actually just a big one that many yeah. people were very... Literally. Yeah. <laughs> yeah exactly. It was a whale of a creature. Yeah, that, yeah. And, and then the, you know, the Strato Sentinel, which yes. is the, the oh, giant... Yes, the big retriever. Yeah, yeah. the giant retriever Sentinel. Being able to ideate and develop that, I think 343 had some concepts of these, what yeah. they would Conce- look like. 2D, yeah. 2D concept art. So yeah. it was fun to yeah. translate it. And, and how does, you know, how do these legs move? Right. You know, how do the joints work and all that? How fast things? would it be actually translating in space and right. all that we matured? Probably my favorite thing that we got to kind of realize from concept or from kind of an idea to what it would actually be is the interior of the ring. Yes. So, Absolutely. Right. Um, yeah. Nobody up to this point, nobody has ever seen what it, the interior of a ring looks like. No. Yeah. You know, you have ideas, you know what forerunner structures look like, which are kind of iconic architecture. but. Up until this point, I think the only reference image we had was kind of this foggy, hazy, dark, or destroyed architecture. Yeah, yeah destroyed, too. destroyed. Yeah. And, but it was only like skin deep. It wasn't yeah, exactly. like it was just on the surface deep. Yeah. Yeah. But we had to reinvent what it would be all the way you know, mm-hmm. through the thing. We actually went through the whole ring. Yes, right. We went from one side to the, the other outside, side, and then in, and then <laughs> inside, <laughs> and then outside. <laughs> yeah. I mean, and that was the point, really, is we wanted to get a full sense of exploration of a halo ring from different biodiversities, different biomes. You know, movement the and energy. It's alive inside, you know. I think people finally understood. It's like this massive thing, as you said before, we've only touched the almost the, the epidermis layer. Yes, we've exactly. never gone all the way down into the meat and bones. And mm-hmm. and that was just a, a really fantastic thing to, to get to work on. Yeah. On the first day of uh, Outpost Discovery, you know, I was kind of a fly on the wall for most of the day. And yeah. I was there to the bitter end because we were going to do some fixes after day one. And I got a chance to watch the very last ring experience with guests. And Lucky. they had all of the VVIP influencers, all of the celebrity right. gamers in there doing the ring experience. And I could hear them like getting very emotional. And at the end, one of them was crying. Oh, really? Oh, my God. Yeah. I mean, it's really yeah. interesting to see them get that emotional. Because, I mean, these are these are... Fans that they really understand guys, and know? respect. They've the, been waiting. The yeah. For, you know, I was going in there worried that they were going to dismiss it or something. You know, you don't know what to you expect. You don't know what to expect. Especially from these really diehard fans. Yeah. And for them to really embrace it and to be blown away by it, that was a great, uh, probably my favorite moment of the entire experience was being able to be in that room and watch them watch the film. I think that they're already hinting at doing a year two and doing new locations. So I'm hopeful that they pursue that and that this continues to roll out and become more successful and they can build on what they've done as a foundation um, and continue to add new experiences and keep it fresh every year and seeing how it also ties in with their new game releases and everything else they're doing because now that fans have a place to go to talk about these things and to experience these things together yeah Yeah. it's a platform yeah It, it, it delivers the fresh content that fans are constantly looking for in a new and very vibrant way that you don't get when you're just watching a video online from you know an, an announcement or something like that. This conversation was a blast, and we will be continuing it into part two, where we'll be moving on from the vision and narrative of Outpost Discovery to talking about how the actual vision was implemented. We'll be speaking to other members from our team for that episode, including members of our CGI department and our sound department. And if we're lucky, we may even get a chance to speak to Gabriella herself. If you have any questions, comments, or ideas for future episodes, we want to remind you that you can please email us at podcast at falconscreativegroup.com. Also, quick, short, shameless plug, 
Our website has a brand new look and it looks pretty awesome. So if you want to check us out online, you can also find us at falconscreativegroup.com. Check it out. We'll see you in the next episode. Thank you so much for listening. This has been Experience Imagination. For more information about this episode's discussion, be sure to visit our blog at falconscreativegroup.com. And don't forget to follow Falcons Creative Group on LinkedIn, Facebook, and Instagram.